right, Kevin, I think we are good to go. Um, so I'm going to start with just a little bit of house cleaning stuff. Um, for those of you that haven't joined us before, I'm Tristana Bickford. I'm the department's communications director based out of the Santa Fe office. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. We are recording tonight's session, and we will be posting that up on the YouTube, on the department's YouTube channel, probably a little bit later this week. I mean, I guess it'll be Wednesday or Thursday before it gets up there, but it will be up on the department's YouTube channel. We are also broadcasting on um, Facebook. So if you happen to have missed part of it or want to check back on some of the information or you can't quite remember where to find some of the links that we're going to give you tonight, you can check those out on the Facebook page or on the YouTube channel um, here later this week. Uh, for those of you that are here in the Zoom room, we do have our Q&A uh, box open. So please make sure and add your questions there and we'll do our best to work relevant questions into the conversation. Um, and for those of you on Facebook, we're gonna try to keep track of the chat and incorporate your questions as well. Um, our Spanish translator is in the attendee room. So if anybody prefers to speak in Spanish, we can bring Darren in and ask your question through, um, through our translator. And a couple of important dates, because you know I think that's why we are all here tonight is that we are interested in applying for the big game draw. Um, the next deadline coming up, well, as you can tell, the, the applications are open. So I know of several people that have already submitted their applications and good for you for being on time. Um, Kevin and I were just talking and I haven't done mine yet, but I got to get them in, in the next, um, I believe we have 23 days now, Kevin. <laughs> so maybe just under because we're after five o'clock. Um, but we do have our um, incentive program that if you apply early before March 9th at 5 p.m., you can qualify for our incentives, um, which range from everything from an external frame backpack donated by Sportsman's Warehouse. There is a federal ammo swag pack. There is um, discounts to Onyx. And we just got a new partner that signed up today. So I'm excited to announce that, announce that later in this week as soon as we have all of our confirmations in place. And then of course, the big deadline is March 16th at 5 p.m. Don't be late on that. Make sure and have your application completed by 5 p.m. at the very latest, because the system will kick you out. Um, I talked to legislators that have been kicked out, um, people from the department that have been kicked out. So make sure and have that application done by 5 p.m. And then for those of you that are still out hunting, um, Barbary, Ibex, Havelina, Oryx, or if you're a trapper, those harvest reports are due April 7th. So make sure and, and get those dates on your calendar. Um, but Kevin, that's the housekeeping stuff that I have so far. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to start a little bit with who you are. You've been with the department for quite a while. So tell us a little bit about you and your job and what does the day in the life of a regional biologist look like? Well, obviously, Tristana, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> anytime I get a chance to visit with, uh, with folks in this session, um, I really do enjoy it. So thank you very much. Uh, as you said, um, I, I've been with the department. Actually, today is my anniversary day. So I started with the department uh, on this day in 1999. So it's 23 years and going strong um, and, and, and having a good time with it. So as you said, I, I've been, I am a regional wildlife biologist and I've been in this current position for, <clears throat> I think about, a uh, little over six years, uh, I've, I've held different positions in the department, um, starting off as a, as a district officer, commission law enforcement officer, and, <clears throat> and then progressed through the department in various different jobs. This job right here, regional wildlife uh, position, it, it does vary by, you know, by region, um, but specifically kind of the general things that we're responsible for uh, conducting aerial surveys, ground surveys. Uh, and again, that just depends on which region you're in. Maybe some are more elk or more deer, uh, pronghorn, et cetera. Uh, we do have oryx within my region. So I work directly with White Sands Missile Range um, and that may be doing ground surveys or, or going out on, on uh, conducting um, hunts with them on San Andres Wildlife Refuge, which we've been uh, helping out with those orcs hunts this past year. So it's it's pretty diverse. I mean, those are just quick examples of what I've been doing. Maybe go out on a bighorn sheep mortality on White Sands Missile Range to determine the cause of the of the the mortality, and then report back to our Santa Fe staff for bighorn sheep biologists uh, Eric and Caitlin. 
So again, those are just specific examples, but it's pretty diverse. This time of year, as you know, is we're rocking and rolling with the, the draw. So definitely get lots of hunters calling in saying, hey, I've got some questions about this unit, this unit. Uh, what's What do you think based on you know my preferences, which is actually what we're going to get into tonight on kind of molding what a hunter should you know should be looking for when they want to apply, and and that could be residents or non-residents. It doesn't matter from from where I sit. So I do enjoy it, and it's rocking on. I've got one year to go before I retire, so y'all better use me as much as you can before I go. Oh, we plan on it. Don't don't worry about that. <laughs> you know. You know, I was, we were just talking before the starts and I've contacted you a few times this last year with hunts that, that I was lucky enough to draw and just, you know, talking it out and getting some advice. And um, I, I really appreciated it, but I wanted to mention one of the surveys you did, I want to say it was about a year ago. And I thought it was really um, creative was that you worked with the, I believe it was the Las Cruces police department and got their drone to go do surveys of Ibex in the Floridas. Yeah. You know, uh, amazingly enough, that was January of 2020, right before the pandemic actually hit. It's crazy how the time, and everyone here can probably attest how the time flies. But you're absolutely right. They kind of reached out to us, and I mean, I've had interest in using drones for uh, surveys, um, and actually done a little bit of research. And and I, and and I think with the technology progressing over the next few years, I think we'll get there you know, hopefully sooner rather than later, but um, it's definitely a, a, a fun thing. They were phenomenal to work with. They actually had three drones that they brought out. We met at the Florida mountains, like you said, south of Deming, uh, and actually were able to find some Ibex. They were able to get some good footage uh, of the Ibex as, as the best one was as they were running over the cliff, kind of around the front of the cliff and then over it. And uh, so, it's like I said, it's exciting technology and we'll get there eventually. And they, of course, they, they were great to work with. Yep. That's awesome. I know that the footage that you guys shared with me was amazing. So, um, but I want to jump into the meat and potatoes because I know that we're going to cover a, a lot of information <laughs> here tonight. We have a lot of numbers, statistics, places to find information. Um, so I wanted to jump in and, and focus most of our time on that. But I want to, of course, we're going to talk tonight about the draw odds report and, and how to use that when applying for hunts in, um, you know, I think it's, it's pretty interesting that you can go in and you can look at it. And um, I had someone show me a couple weeks ago that there's a pronghorn hunt that if you put it as third choice, you're never going to get it. That it's just, it's just not going to happen. But there's, we produce this report annually to help hunters, you know, select what choices and, and how to, um, put in their first, second, and third choice to, to make the best educated decision that they can possibly make. And I hear all the time that, you know, people I put in for 10 years and I've never gotten drawn. And, um, and I know you also are going to talk a little bit about um, some of the hunts that may be more of an opportunity that you get to go hunting, um, even if the, the quantity of animals might be a little bit lower. So, so first of all, I want to start off with, um, you know, where do you find the draw odds reports? And, and how is it, how can you use it to, to help with your hunt application? Absolutely. I'm going to, and hopefully this is going to work here. I've got, share my screen. And so this is our, our web, public website, uh, of course, wildlife.state.nm.us. And the first thing I think before we do there, I was going to scroll down for Sin and just say, uh, go to our publications. What I always do first, and, and this is, uh, of course, I'm just, you know, as you and I were talking a while ago, growing up, whether it's the application deadline or when the, the, the rules and information booklet proclamation, you know, came out, it was just like Christmas. So, of course, we do have our paper. I don't know if that's going to show up too well, but this is the last year's uh, big game rules and information booklet. And so if you don't have that, we can definitely go to our publications uh, page. And then that way you can have that available because I think that's definitely something um, you know we do have a four-year reg cycle where our hunt codes typically stay stable for four years but still always use the specific uh, year for you know rules and information booklet for the draws that way the hunt codes match up because sometimes when they do change it can throw you off pretty big but definitely have that available 
uh, and then go back to the home page. Um, there's some tabs right here, um, and hopefully you can see where my cursor hits the hunting and go down to big game and draw hunts. And I think I'll just go ahead and click on that right now because um, as you pointed out, I think we first want to go into actually how the draw works a little bit first. And this right here, as you can see, has application requirements. It, how the draw system works. Kevin, can you make your screen just a little bit bigger? I think if you do um, like control and the, the plus sign, it should increase it. So there you go. Is that better? Okay. That's better. Thank you. No, good. I wasn't even thinking about that. <laughs> but yeah, maybe that's a little bit too big, but <clears throat> excuse me. So definitely right there. You can see application requirements, how the draw hunt system works. Um, it goes down to the quotas, which we'll get into here in a little bit. But first, if you'll see under draw info, odds, and success tips, then you see how the draw works. And again, kind of the same information, maybe a little bit different format, odds and reports, and success tips. So. All, all of this information, if you go to this big game and draw hunts uh, section and then just kind of read each one of those, we'll definitely obviously be going over that tonight. But sometimes, as you know, this is always good to refer back to, you know, with any questions or anything, you know, definitely in the future, here's where all the information is. At, and so beginning with this is we, how, how, how it works i uh, actually go down here to the, the application requirements. Um, as you said, March 16th is the, is the deadline at 5 p.m. We have, I think I'll first just kind of go with exactly what it said. And that is when everybody's application is submitted to the department, it's not put into separate pools for each species. It's not put in for elk, deer, bighorn, sheep, et cetera. It's all thrown into basically that proverbial one big pot where all of the applications are thrown in together. They're, then they're randomly sequenced uh, from one all the way down. Let's just say there's 250,000 applications that are submitted this year. So they're sequenced randomly from one to that 250,000. So the first one, it could be uh, an elk application. The second one could be a pronghorn application. And at that point, once, once the department comes in and says, okay, we're ready to, to conduct a draw, they're randomly sequenced, and then it goes in, we'll just start looking at each application, look at the first choice for that first application. Obviously, with the, if it's a number one, you're gonna get your first choice. But let's just scroll down all the way down to 100,000. And it's that the computer is going to look at that first choice. If that hunt code or hunt has been filled, it automatically goes to the second choice. If that hunt has been filled, it will go to the third choice. And if that's been filled, if there's no license available for that, all three choices, that application is set aside. And we can talk about the fourth or fifth choice here in a minute. But I first want to say that uh, that application is set aside and the computer will go to the next application in sequence and begin the whole process over for that application, one, two, and three. Now, once we get into the report itself, we'll, we'll be talking about exactly what you just said, Tristana, was that you can look at, because I, I, I get a, a lot of questions about you know, people apply and say, well, how can, how, you know, it was my first choice and they drew it with their third choice. Well, that's exactly why, because we go by application. So it just goes in sequence and we'll look at all three choices before we go to the next application. And if I apply for um, like four different species, let's say I apply for elk, deer, pronghorn, and bighorn sheep. Does, does each, um, so would that be four applications that I put in? That's correct. You'll have, and, and, and it definitely, uh, for each species, you'll have a separate application. And you'll only be able to submit one application per species. Okay. Now, 
then we can actually, you know, for most of the hunts, uh, deer, elk, et cetera, you can have up to four people on an application. And that is definitely something to consider when we're actually looking at the number of licenses available per pool. And, and I'll just use a non, non-resident as an example that if there's only three, and we'll show this in the draw here in a second, but if there's only three licenses available and there's four people on the application and that application's pulled up, nobody gets a license. So that's again, something I can touch on a little bit later, but one real quick is uh, we have drawing quotas, which this is actually established in state law. Uh, through the legislature uh, quite a few years ago. Um, and, he, and you can see the verbiage here, a minimum of 84% uh, go to New Mexico residents through the draw. Up to 10% go to residents and non-residents applying with the New Mexico registered outfitter. And up to 6% are awarded to non-residents applying without a registered, a New Mexico registered outfitter. <clears throat> and again, that's very important when we get to the actual license numbers, because if there's not, not enough licenses available to, uh, to apply for a non-resident, um, in, a, in a sense, it's a wasted application because the non-resident didn't even have a chance to, to draw that license. And the best example of that, Tristan, is probably our statewide deer and elk uh, license. We have one license per year. Um, by this state law, that goes to a New Mexico resident. So uh, it will would never go to uh, someone applying to the outfitter pool or the non-resident pool. So again, that's kind of an extreme example, but it's a good one to show there, there's no reason to even apply for that license. Yeah, that, that's true. And, you know, I always say that somebody has to draw that license, so you might as well apply for it. Because yeah, exactly. What an yes. amazing opportunity. But I, I should clarify when I say that, that residents should apply for it, not the non-residents. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's exactly you know, right. Is there any preference to, um, you know, some, say somebody who has never applied before or um, is applying for the first time or hasn't, hasn't drawn in a while? Is there any preference in the system for somebody that would fit that description? No, it, uh, New Mexico is a random draw every year. We have no preference point systems, no bonus point systems. Uh, in preparation for this today, I was kind of going over different states' uh, systems, and I was watching uh, one on YouTube about Utah. They even have a hybrid preference point and bonus point system. So <laughs> it, it was very confusing to me. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously very happy to be in New Mexico where it's a random draw every year. So, and that's something I think is important to point out that, you know, with these drawing odds and the report that we, uh, you know, uh, produce every year, you know, that is definitely, you know, something in history. And it's not, and it's not a guarantee based on those reports that, oh, last year it was a guaranteed draw. That doesn't guarantee that this year is going to be a guaranteed draw because there's going to be a lot of people that, you know, do like me and you, and you study those draws and say, wow, this one is, is, a uh, is, is guaranteed last year. And you put in, you don't draw it and you say, well, you know, game and fish, you know, what's going on? Well, that's a good example that other people are looking at exact same thing and, and more people are applying for those specific hunts. So that's something what I do is I actually like to get several years worth of draws reports and then look at the history of that to show the trend. Okay, is there more people applying for those specific hunts that I want to put in for or is it as a downward trend or is it pretty stable? And, and using these reports I've actually been pretty successful in drawing licenses through the years, obviously not every year, but it definitely, I think, has helped me, um, you know, especially when we start talking about putting in for those hunts, like you said, is a little bit more opportunity hunts where you're the opportunity to go hunting versus putting in for the real hard to draw hunts like 16A and D, you know, which, like you said, th those are drawing, I mean, it's, it's still luck of the draw, you could get drawn, but Statistically, it's going to be pretty low odds. Yep. That's 
That's great. We had a question come in about how has COVID impacted the number of people applying for big game hunts? And I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but we were up significantly last year in the um, 2021 draw cycle. I haven't seen any numbers come in for this year yet, but I, I don't know. On a personal level, I kind of hope there's not that many people to put in, even though, you know, from a department standpoint, it, it's a good thing. And, and, you know, for passing down traditions, it's a good thing to have people interested in hunting in the state. <laughs> Absolutely right. And, and I'm just going to throw some numbers. I believe we had, it's just increased every year, if I remember correctly. I think last year was a 60,000 application bump from the previous year. So definitely, it seems like the trend is more and more people are applying for these hunts. Like you said, which is a which is a good thing. I mean, our drawing odds are going down, but I think that's an important point to make that, you know, I, I think we need to be as hunters uh, a whole lot more available to each other and say, yeah, we need to help each other out in something like this. Yeah, we may not go hunting every year, but we can definitely help out, especially in our jobs. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we talked a little bit about how the draw itself works. Um, did we miss anything important in how it works and how the tags are allocated? Uh, just one quick point, um, and I, I think it's down here that um, there's going to be, and they are actually in specified in the booklet as well, but there are some hunts that are uh, by state law specifically set aside, set aside for residents, such as um, antlerless or cow elk licenses or wildlife management areas uh, for residents only. So those, some, those are definitely things to be considered of before, you, before anybody applies is what are they eligible for? Mm -hmm. that, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that one up. Okay, so going back to where you find the draw odds report, are there multiple years listed there or um, where do you find for previous years? Absolutely. So I hit on the draw info odds and tips, and you can see again, this is that first tab where how the New Mexico's draw works, just a different interpretation language on how that is. Um, before I go into that, the six success tips um, kind of goes into what we're going to go talking about today is obviously how the draw works, do your homework, uh, you know, visit, call us uh, with the department. Uh, look at different type hunts, like you said, maybe a different weapon type, archery. Um, <clears throat> and you see sporting arms there, cow versus bull for elk. Um, although, you know, even applying for cow these days is, is pretty high uh, demand and, and low odds. And, and we can talk about the fourth choice when we actually get there. But, but to your question, Tristana, the odds and reports, uh, like I said, I like to look at the history of um, you know, it's no different than, than data, you know, sociological, biological data. You've got the, the complete report and the summary, and that goes back for several years. Uh, if, if a person, you know, wants to go back any further, they can definitely contact the department at our Santa Fe office and, and request those reports for previous years. And that way they can get a little bit longer trend of, of you know, who's applying for what specific hunts. Because like I said, it actually does really help quite a bit to see that history uh, and, and to see how those are impacted. Because um, like you said, we're, we get more and more uh, uh, hunters applying every year. So mm -hmm. definitely it's going to, it, it can help. And one other thing, as you're, as you're clicking in there, um, you had mentioned that we have a four-year rule cycle. And so we are currently in the middle and next year, so the 2023-2024 hunting season is going to be completely different. You're going to have to go back and look at, at the, the current year and our previous year rule and information booklet to match up those hunt codes. Absolutely. No, that's a, that's a real good point. So, uh, and again, that's why kind of when, when, whenever you're getting all your information together is just make sure the, the years match. Uh, because if anything does change based off of that rule cycle, it can throw that report completely off. So it's a really good point. Yes. Yep. Okay. So what's next? We found the web page. What's what's your next step? Well, so and and I actually had quite a few people call me this year um, and and actually ask questions about the. There's two documents, and I'll just say these two documents up on top. 
for the 2021, uh, the complete report and the summary. And I, and, and I, like I said, I actually had quite a few calls this year specifically about the summary. And I think I've got, let me put this over here. I've already got it pulled up. So I don't necessarily, I, I don't really use this report. I think it's good as, as again, just like the title says, it's a summary. So it gives you a general overview of how many people are applying uh, by, uh, by pool. So resident pool, the non-resident pool and the outfitter. But if you can see over here on the right, hopefully everybody can see this, is the post draw successful applicant information. It, it actually has uh, the number of licenses drawn for each choice. But Tressa and, and everybody, if y'all can see, it doesn't have specifically, um, let me do this right here. It doesn't have what pool drew what. So as an example, obviously Antelope 1-101, there's only three licenses available. So based on what we said, at least 84% has to go to residents. Those are all residents, okay? But when you get down to <clears throat> when there's, uh, you know, 20 licenses, as an example, it says eight, three, and nine. We don't know what, who drew those, residents, non-residents, or, or outfitters. So I, I think this is a good cursory to look at this and say, yeah, okay, well, I can look at the number of people um, real quickly, but what I like to do is, is actually use the complete uh, report. So I'm gonna do something real quick. I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm going to pull up the complete report. Hopefully you can see that, Tristana. Okay, good. So, and I actually have one highlight as a specific hunt that I wanna talk about, but, <clears throat> excuse me, this report, and, and it, I've kind of got it condensed, so it may be a little bit tough to see, but I can, I can zoom in a little bit, and hopefully that's a little bit better, but so, and I'll just kind of start off on the very left side, Tristan, if that's okay with you, and just kind of go through the entire thing, okay? All right, so Again, like we said several times, you'll see on the very left-hand column, the very first column, you're going to have the hunt code. And again, it's very important to match up the years of this drawing report to the 2021-22 uh, Big Game Rules and Information Booklet, because that hunt code is going to match up. So for this one right here, you'll see DER-1-181. DER meaning for deer will have ELK, elk for elk, and it goes on down per species. So it, it's going to list the hunt code, uh, and one, uh, you'll see the DER-1, one being for any legal weapon, which is typically rifle. You can use a lesser weapon within that hunt code as well, muzzleloader, bow, and crossbow. Uh, DER-2 is going to be archery only. Uh, three is muzzleloader uh, or bow. So you can use, again, something that's lesser within that. So that's a good way to look at those hunt codes, one for what any legal weapon, two for archery, three for muzzleloader. <clears throat> we have the unit description, which is the unit. Again, it's gonna, it's gonna uh, uh, apply directly to what's in the rib as well. The number of licenses available. And now we get into the meat and potatoes, <laughs> like I call it. And like I said last year, I, I nerd out on numbers. This is something I really like to do. Um, and, and so now we're getting into how many people are actually applying for each hunt? You'll see the hunt total. And this is, as we said in, uh, in the beginning, the first, second, and third choice. So that's how many people are applying per choice. Then the next call, these next three columns right here, actually six call, uh, nine columns, but it's actually gonna show the number of residents per choice the number of non-residents per hunt choice, and the number of outfitting outfitted uh, hunts by choice as well. So, and, and I wanna make this point real clear right now. Um, 
So as an example, Tristana, that I'm talking to an out, let's say I'm talking to a, a hunter from Wisconsin. And he says, hey, I want to come out to your great state and I want to hunt elk. I went and I refer him to this report. Um, and we can actually just go all the way down to an elk and we'll just pick a choice. <clears throat> let's say unit 34 real quick. So as a non-resident, there's absolutely no reason for him to be looking into the number of residents that actually apply for that specific hunt. Vice versa, I won't look at the number of non-residents that apply because I'm not competing against that the non-residents or the outfitter pool. I'm only competing against the residents. And so, as we said, in this specific example right here, there's 200 licenses available, and you can see that uh, residents drew, if I'm looking at this correctly, hopefully I am, <laughs> 168, okay? So that's how many licenses that I have a chance at, whereas this a hunter from Wisconsin, he has a chance at, see if I can come over here, to... 12 total licenses and so that's a very good point I want to make is that looking at the number 12 for that for that hunter from Wisconsin and you come back over here and look at the number of non-residents that are applying for that specific hunt and so what I like to do as you can see that I highlighted that and again Excel it will actually total that up for you there's 1,040 applicants, uh, non-resident applicants for that hunt code. So we're going to draw 12 out of that 1,040. Now, you can see here that I'm going to do something real quick. Tristan, if you don't mind me doing something. Well, well you're doing that. So the, the pre-draw and the post-draw, what is the difference in those two number groups? Absolutely. So the pre-draw, again, this is going to be the number of people that actually applied, and the post-draw is going to be the number of licenses drawn for that specific hunt code. And so as, you, as this specific example, there's 393 first choice non-resident applicants for that hunt code, 415 for the second choice, and 232 for the third choice. And let's run over here to the right. And again, based on our description of how the draw works earlier, Tristana and everybody, you can see that in this example, six first choice applicants were successful. And then six second choice applicants were successful and zero as a third. So, this may be a, 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 a good point, like we said before, is based on this, you would say, well, there's no reason to put this down as my third choice, right? Well, that could be this specific year, because if you go back the previous three to four years, that could be completely different where you had more people applying for the third choice. And again, statistically, it kind of works out that way, that maybe they would get drawn on the third choice. That's why I say look at the history of it, because one year doesn't necessarily tell you the entire story, okay? And especially in this instance, you know, yeah, you're looking at this for this one year, it would be a moot point to put it down as your third choice, okay? But again, we don't know necessarily what's going to happen this, this upcoming year. A whole lot less people get to it, but it gives you a, a trend on what's happened in the past to give you better information for the future. That, that's kind of how my brain works, is it? I know it's not a guarantee, but it's definitely something that gives you a whole lot better idea on, on how it works, okay? Mm -hmm. And you can see here for, so let's say, as I, as, let's say you and I were putting in for this hunt as residents, and you can see here that we had, and I'll just, uh, <clears throat> that's not a good color, Tristana. <laughs> <laughs> It's not as easy to see, but yeah. you can see that the number of residents applying for this, uh, and obviously this is a very low odds, you know, high demand hunt. Um, 
and I actually did that a little bit wrong, but 119 resident hunters drew that as their first choice out of 825. Now, before we go any further, I really wanted to make the point, and again, I and, I, and as much as I am, I really like numbers and I really like math. I am not a high level statistician and I admit that on the front end. So there's guys who are talking about this, that you can run multiple scenarios and get your, your drawing odds kind of narrowed down to some specific. I'm, I don't do that because ultimately it's very hard what I like to do is I like to look at the overall number of applicants and, and the number of licenses is actually drawn. So 168 divided by 2,240. Now, that's not the true drawing odds, okay, statistically, because someone that, let, let's use this example right here, Tristana, that there's 905 second choice applicants for this hunt code. But some of those people actually drew their first choice. So by the time it gets down to this, they're already out of this pool, okay? We're not competing against those people that actually drew their first choice. Same thing with a third choice. Maybe someone drew their first or second. So we're not, at those, again, that's the way I like to explain it to myself and to, and to others is that's kind of the worst drawing odds you'll have is, 168 out of 2,240, okay? Now, we know that the drawing odds statistically a whole lot better than that, but at least if you look through several of these hunts, you can say, wow, well, there's only 20 people putting in, you know, over three choices for 10 tags. My worst at worst point is going to be 50% drawing odds, right? But we actually know that that's actually better in, in reality, Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> it does. It's taken me two years of going through this with you before really. I'm like, oh, I get that now. <laughs> <laughs> I would encourage everyone to go back and, and double check this. But yes, that's, that is making sense to me now. <laughs> okay, good. Well, and as I said, sometimes I have a hard time it, uh, speaking what's in my brain. So <laughs> I, I want to hopefully be articulate and, uh, and actually explain this a little bit better. Um, but I, I did, so the reason I highlighted this one, Tristan and everybody is it, it goes back to what you said before and, and I'm, and hopefully this is the correct one. So this one right here actually has a fourth choice. Okay. Now for some species, we have the fourth choice option. And the fourth choice option is uh, you pick a region, and if there's any leftover licenses for that weapon type from your first choice, and if your sequence number is low enough, that you'll accept a fourth choice license, and it may be in any unit in that region. So this is a good example, uh, unit 29 uh for the archery hunt and i'm probably going to say that that is a september hunt tristan i didn't actually look it up and i can look at it real quick um, you're going to give so, me bad grades for not being prepared no not at all <laughs> <laughs> so essentially when you do an application you can do your first three choices where you pick a very specific hunt code with the weapon type and dates and then if you select the fourth choice it's any hunt that has available licenses left over in that quadrant of the states. Um, and so in this case, it's uh, unit 29 had last year, they had leftover tags. So if somebody put that fourth choice, they may have drawn this, this hunt. And it, it's not, maybe not one that they put as first, second, third choice, but it was an option, uh, opportunity for them to go hunting. Exactly. And like I said, it has to, the, it has to match up with their first choice weapon type. And so a point that I think both of you and I actually missed, Tristana, is that we uh, in New Mexico, you can mix and match weapon types. So your first choice may be for a rifle hunt. Your second choice could be for a bow and your third could be for a muzzleloader or uh, any variation of that. 
but the fourth choice actually refers back to your first choice. So as an example, let's say me um, that, you know, as an example, I've never bow hunted in my life and I hunt, put all three weapon types, you know, uh, uh, rifle choices. Well, I'm not going to draw a bow as on a fourth choice if I check that box. Okay. Or, or vice versa, whatever that weapon type is. But this is a good example of what you said in the very beginning is that uh, um, this could be a great opportunity uh, for someone to say, you know, I didn't get my first three choices. I'm going to put that fourth choice down and luck of the draw. As you can see here, 71 people actually drew that. So on their fourth choice. Now, again, there's a lot of pros and cons to that from the standpoint you may be unfamiliar with the unit, but I will say that that's why the department is available. You can talk to game wardens or biologists or whoever in the department to get information about that specific unit before the hunt uh, rolls around and, and get your leg up before, you know, getting your maps and doing your homework, uh, e-scouting, getting all that information done. And that way you're prepared for the hunt. So if you drew your fourth choice and you, you never even stepped in the unit, before. Um, and so there's definitely resources out there that will definitely help you out. So, yep. So <clears throat> one thing I also wanted to make is, again, any application per species has no bearing on any other application that you submit. So if, if you, uh, again, if you are a uh, lucky in this year's draw you could draw every application that you uh, that you submit okay or the complete ex other extreme is you could be completely unlucky and not draw anything mm -hmm. it, and again we we're saying last year has no bearing on this year and each application has no bearing on the other applications that you submit so and, and it's it, like I said, it's definitely something that you, uh, it, 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 I like my personally, I like it. It's a random draw every year. So when, Kevin, I'm, not, I'm not sure which hunt code you were going to go to next, but, um, I know that a lot of people like to structure it uh, as, you know, maybe your first choice is the harder to draw hunt. And then a third choice is maybe an easier to draw hunt, more of an opportunity hunt instead of a, um, a, an older age class of animal. Um, can you, show us the difference and what those might look like. And you may be getting there and I may be jumping ahead. So I apologize. No, 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 I'm, I'm glad you asked it because that was something that, yeah, kind of goes in line with uh, the strategy. Like you said, is doing your homework and getting a strategy, getting a plan, getting your goals set aside before you even start applying to say, you're absolutely right. So based on, <clears throat> and, and I know there's a lot of people, I'm not the only one that does this, but uh, in this example right here, um, you know, what I'll just go with this. I'm going to go with the very beginning of them right here. So as an example, you could put, actually, <clears throat> sorry about this. <clears throat> You're good. So the statewide deer draw, and again, I, I'm, I'm being selfish in a sense of I'm talking about residents only. Uh, so hopefully non-residents out there don't be throwing rocks at me. <laughs> but the, the statewide deer hunt, we have one license available. So this is an extreme example. Um, definitely you, you, you could put this down as your first choice, okay? And, cause, and, and definitely you wouldn't want to put this down as your second or third choice at all. I mean, this is an extreme example, but I'm glad I wanted to bring that one up because uh, you're going to, that whoever puts that, draws that license is going to draw it statistically from a first choice, okay? It's just going to happen. So don't put it down as a second choice or third choice. So what I like to do is, is put these hard to draw hunts as a first choice and then go to exactly what you said, Tristana, was go to some unit <clears throat> and I'm going to get away from the units I put in for because I'm going to be selfish tonight. <laughs> But, but as an example, let's, let's say um, that unit 20, I, I, I did highlight unit 20 and I've drawn it before. It's a great little hunt. Um, you can see here that 
I may want to put that down as my second choice because you can see it's a little bit, it's, it's not guaranteed. It's a little bit harder drawing odds, but it's a whole lot better odds than the statewide deer hunt. Okay. And then go down to, uh, and these are extreme examples, but we'll go ahead and use the unit 29 example, Tristana, uh, this right here in last year's, uh, draw, this was a guaranteed draw. And again, we don't ever want to say that last year was guaranteed. This year is going to be guaranteed. But in this instance, because we had four choice people actually drew it, if I had put this down as my third choice last year, I would have drawn this hunt. So these are examples of what you said is you put your first choice down as an extremely, you know, high demand, low odds hunt. And then put the, your second and third choice are for hunts that uh, may not be where you're going to see 27, you know, 190 inch bucks, you know, every hunt, but you're more than likely going to see deer in those hunts. And then your third choice could be something like this where, hey, it may be a completely new unit that I've never even set foot in, but you know what, I'm going to take that opportunity and learn something, learn a new area, learn, you know, meet some new people. You know, that's the other part about hunters is you go and, and, and you meet good people in the field. So these are different examples of what I like to do uh, uh, to increase my odds. And I do that per species. Now, obviously, if you go down to the bighorn sheep uh, uh, example, again, being the extreme example, Tristana, is it really doesn't matter. Just apply. <laughs> you're, you're not really going to increase your odds. It's that is simply luck of the draw. You need to have a very, very low sequence number to even be considered for bighorn. And, but at least for these other species, you can definitely increase your, your drawing odds. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know, I was going to show you the bighorn. Anybody that hasn't seen the bighorn, you can see that it, it <clears throat> excuse me real quick. You can see that we have um, 113 total licenses and that's for RAM and you. And we have 13,000 people applying for those. So it's obviously, um, you know, very low drawing odds. And it's just, it's, uh, hey, go for, go for the moon, you know, if you apply. And I thought I had one, Tristana, where I had actually had it highlighted. Um, well, again, let's just use this one right here real quick. We have 10 licenses available. So based on the, and again, we're bound by state law. It's not something that, you know, it, it is what it is. <clears throat> there is no license available for the non-resident, okay? Um, we have one license that is drawn for the outfitted pool. So you can see here in this example that nine, 90% of the red, of the licenses go to residents and one went to the outfitter pool. And again, like we said, everybody, uh, in that outfitter pool, that can be residents or non-residents applying with the New Mexico registered outfitter. So <clears throat> in this example, again, based off this, uh, a non-resident shouldn't even apply. So you really won't even have uh, a chance until you get down to 11 licenses. Um, and all the way down to where you potentially can have two licenses is 25 licenses. So looking at those drawing odd report year in, year out and say, okay, well, who drew, and that's why Tristan, everybody, that's why I like the, the complete drawing odds report because it actually shows you heck, how many people in your pool are drawing licenses based on the total number of licenses available. So you can see here that, you know, there were two in this pool right here, um, uh, 20, you know, 20 licenses available. So 90% go to residents and 10% and go to, um, in this instance, there, there were no non-residents that drew this. And so, and there's good reason why, if you go back over here, Tristana, you'll see that this is a wildlife management area. So therefore, by state law, non-residents are not allowed to put in for those. I mean, I, I don't mean to sound negative, 
but I definitely want to be as honest with people as I can because you don't want them to waste or use a choice that is not not available to them. So, Kevin, you, I'm going to guess you at least broached this, but I don't know the answer, so I apologize if I'm throwing off guard. But on those hunts that are for resident only, um, does it still get any tags allocated to the outfitter pool, um, assuming that a, a resident would apply with an outfitter? Yeah, and in, in this example right here, you can see um, that it, those must have been residents that applied in the outfitter pool. Okay. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, and I bet we could go through this report and find those specific ones. Um, more than likely, not for for cow hunts because more than likely those are not outfitted hunts. But this is a good example here where those those would be residents applying with a New Mexico registered outfitter. For the wildlife management area correct yep um and to sorry to change subjects but i do see a couple of hands that come up in the list so um we will be taking comments in the q a so if anybody has questions here in zoom just type them into the q a um or if they're longer and we need to have a conversation please shoot me an email or give me a phone call and we can we can get connected with somebody to help answer those questions but um and I do have some questions when you're ready, Kevin, but I'm not sure. I know you had several items highlighted, so I don't know if there was another hunt code you wanted to talk about. No, go ahead and ask your questions. Yeah, I think okay. I touched on the main points right now so far. Mm -hmm. And what one of the questions that I wanted to mention before my mind changed tracks, but um, I believe on our website, you can also get the harvest report. So you can go in and see um, and I don't want to delve too deeply on that tonight or else, you know, we may be here until midnight and <laughs> I, I would appreciate everybody that would stick us out with it, but um, I, I would recommend looking at those reports and seeing, you know, you may have a higher chance to draw, but we, we do have um, our, the way our system is set up is that we do have hunts that are, that are really for opportunity and you get the opportunity to go and you're likely to see something, but you're not going to see a significant number of you know, 360 plus bulls or 190, you know, you're not going to see those big um, older age class animals, as many of them anyways. Tristana, that is a, a, an excellent, excellent point. And that kind of goes back to <clears throat> when, when a hunter, when everybody is using their strategy and, and actually planning out those, that's a really fantastic point to make. And you can go back in. And again, this is when you're doing your homework, and, and, and looking at these harvest reports, looking at the draw and odds reports, and then calling us here at the department and, and with specific questions and saying, well, you know, wow, I mean, you know, why is it that, you know, this has a 25% success rate? And it goes back to what you said, well, those are being managed more for opportunity units where you're more likely to get drawn, but like you said, the the chances of, of seeing that older age class or seeing that buck may be a lot lower based on densities or or whatever the case is, maybe timing of the hunt, et cetera, or, or more hunters are in, in that in the field at one time. But that's a great, great point. And actually, and I'll probably even go back a little bit further, if you don't mind, and just say that may be really good to educate, uh, you know, whoever you are out there on how we are managing those specific hunts. And that goes to that rule cycle that we are uh, uh, currently going through right now this year. And I'll put that plug in. We, we definitely want everybody's comments in this rule cycle. And so educating yourself on, as an example, like you said before, okay, the, the greater Gila is managed for uh, quality hunting for, for elk. So, you know, our bull to cow ratio is a little bit higher. Our, our uh, dense, hunter density is a little bit lower, so it's a better quality hunt um, where you actually have a little bit better chance of, like you said, seeing a 360 class bull, uh, older age class animal. And, and then going back, once you've educated yourself and say, okay, well, now this is starting to make a whole lot more sense that, you know, I may get drawn for this specific unit, but the chances of being successful are a little bit lower. So I need to put in some more homework and I need to do, put a little bit more work on the ground to make sure that I am successful. So knowing that on the front end, how you can then strategize and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, use my hunts this way or this way. Uh, and in that way, you can typically be a little bit more successful. That's a really great point. Yep. 
jump into the questions. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read this one as is because I don't I don't want to try and translate it and get and get it wrong. But um, Kevin, you stated earlier that the hunt codes stay the same for essentially for four years. How does that correlate with the big game complete draw odds information? Meaning, is the trend essentially a four year window? So. Uh... Well, the hunt code itself, and, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but yes, correct. It's for the four-year rule cycle, unless we change something mid-reg cycle, which is pretty rare, that hunt code is going to be associated with that specific hunt in that GMU for four straight years. We won't change those uh, for any certain reason. Now, maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but in this example right here, Tristana, you can see <coughs> DER-1-126. Again, we know that DER stands for deer, one stands for any legal weapon. 126, that's really for department uh, stand. That's, that's what we use in order to identify that specific hunt. It really has no bearing on the specific, like next year, DER-1-126 in the new rule cycle, as you said, 23-24, that may be for unit four because we've eliminated several hunts up here. So the 126 really has no bearing on, on anything specifically for GMU. Hopefully that's the, uh, I understood that question correctly. I think, I think so. And, and so when you download, a, uh, like the report that you have up, it's for the 2021-2022 big game rib rules and information. And so it's important to correlate that because we have, I believe there was four years worth of reports up there. And so it's very important to look at each downloaded Excel sheet and each rules and information booklet to make sure each year, year by year matches all the way down. Yes, and definitely, and that's, and again, in this specific example, you'll see 2021. Whereas our big game rules and information booklet is 2021 to 2022. So these drawage reports are always the first year of that hunting season. So this one is example 2021 to 22. So that's how, like you said, you, you definitely wanna be able to match up the big game rules and information booklet with that specific drawage report. Yes, yep. Thank you. Okay, it, next question, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, sorry, real quick. In some instances, Trisanna, you know, the hunt code's, you know, 99% not going to change mid-reg cycle, but in some instances, we actually do change license numbers. It's, it's, it's very rare. I mean, I'm not saying we do that for a lot of species or a lot of hunts, but sometimes, as you know, you know, in a, a, something's going to happen out in the field, and we're going to say, oh my goodness, we're going to have to drop licenses or reduce licenses down, or... Uh, um, or increase. More likely, we're not going to increase, but uh, it's more likely on the reducing end. But again, that's a good point to make that maybe the license numbers don't match up, um, you know, if you do have the wrong year. Uh, so make sure you definitely have the right year. Mm -hmm. And that person said, thank you. So we interpreted the question correctly. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so next question, can you comment on the limitations of non-residents applying as a, a party or attaching applications for two or three people on an elk permit? Absolutely. And, and again, I'll actually maybe expound on that a little bit more than the specific question. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, the most extreme, and, and we touched on this before, let's say number one, there's um, three licenses available in the non-resident pool. And the application for four pops up, nobody gets a license, okay? Now, going using that same logic, let's say that there are 30 licenses available in the non-resident pool, okay? But, as, but that specific application with four non-resident applicants on it, uh, let's say their sequence number is, is pretty high. And so, the computer doesn't get to them until real late in the game, okay? And, and at that point, there's only two licenses left out of the 30, and that application of four pops up, same scenario. That applicant, nobody gets, nobody, we're not gonna take two people off of that application 
uh, and give them licenses and the other two are not, or we're not going to exceed the total number that is allowed for that pool. So in that same instance, those that application is going to get kicked aside and they're not going to draw a license. Now, it actually works exactly the same way as let's say, let's say you and I and, and that hunter from Wisconsin, along with his son, apply together. Okay, we're all in the same application, the four of us, two residents and two non-residents. When the seat, when the when the computer looks at that application in the draw, there has to be two resident licenses and two non-resident licenses available for all of us to get to, to be successful. So in that instance, in, in an example, we 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 you know as as non-residents only get six percent, then our chances of getting drawn are actually going to be a lot lower as residents. Now that sounds negative. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm simply going in reality, definitely look at that because as, as and I think you and I both know, you know, hunting is a tradition for my family and, and for yours as well, just talking to you. And, and so applying with family members, if you know that on the front end that your chances may be a little bit lower to get drawn, but if you are successful, hey, you're going with all four people and you may be going with your family, maybe going with your friends because it's that tradition. It's that hunting environment that, you know, you strive for, you want to go with people, you know. So that's something, again, you got to, you know, every hunter has to weigh the pros and the cons uh, and understand, well, my chances, again, may be lower to get drawn, but you know what? I'd much rather go with my son, you know, or I'd much rather go with my father to, on this hunt, as an example. So again, it's not just cut and dry, just specifically with numbers. There's a whole lot of other things to consider, but using this report uh, can actually give you a whole lot more information to say, okay, well, I'll accept this risk based on this because I have other goals, not just to kill that 360 class bull. Maybe it's to go have fun in the mountains and, and uh, with family, friends, uh, or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Not all about the numbers. I always think that's such a hard question because it's, Man, I, I think you're right that it depends so much on your goals. And, and like for me, I, I will always apply for, for deer or elk and some of those with my husband. Um, it, you know, that way I always get to go with him. But, uh, you know, a mutual colleague um, out of the Crucis office was telling me last week that, that she will, will apply with her husband because she feels like she's more likely to get drawn or he's more likely to get drawn and they have the opportunity to go and just one of them gets to hunt and one of them gets to help. And so it was just a totally different way of looking at it. And it was, I, I don't think there's any right answer, but <laughs> just, you have to do what's right for you. <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's why, I mean, you know, again, I, I've been, you know, not only working for New Mexico for 23 years, but I worked with Arizona Game and Fish and, and the, the Forest Service. And so that's what I've always strived to do in my career, Tristana, as everybody is when we're designing these hunts, I mean, cause I've been, you know, doing these rule cycles since, like I said, 1999. And when in the specifically in the Southwest area, I did strive and we, and, and I think we did a really good job of, of offering up different type of hunts for different people. So as example, let's say the burrow mountains deer hunt, you know, low license numbers, uh, low drawing odds, uh, high demand, but yet, and the way I've always kind of described it to, to hunters is you, you won't, will not be able to draw that every year. And again, these, these drawing odds are an example of that, but we also have, we also structured the Southwest and around the state to where you have those high quality units where it's low odds to get drawn but there's some kind of medium opportunity units where it's a little bit better drawing odds, a little bit less better, you know, hunting depending on the age class. But then the extreme example is your opportunity hunts. And so providing that to hunters over my career, I think has been, been uh, very satisfying to say, yeah, you, you won't get drawn for the burrows every year, more than likely. But maybe you could put that down as your first choice and your second and third is put as down as you know, outside of the boroughs in unit 23, where we do have, you know, 
400 licenses available, 450 per hunt. So that's kind of the two examples of the Borough Mountains, 35 licenses for a hunt, okay? And then outside the boroughs, you have 450. So those are really good examples to say what, as an agency, what we're trying to provide and what we've always strived to do is give you and every other hunter out there different options. Because like you said, one size doesn't fit all. Hey, I'm, I may be satisfied with drawing every three to four years, but when I do draw, it's going to be in that low hunter density hunt, you know? Or maybe complete opposite, it's going to be in the burrows and and uh, and I'm willing to accept that because I want to go hunting every year. So those are really good points, I think, to make is that, and again, as an agency, what we strive to do is give, uh, hopefully, is get as many options as possible. That way, you as a hunter or anybody hunter out there that's listening or is not listening, you give, you have more options available. In theory, you're going to be more satisfied. You're not going to be dictated to and say, well, you have to hunt here. No, let's give the hunters the choice. All right, next question. Um, what dictates a low sequence number on an application? I'm sorry, say that again. What, what dictates a low sequence number on an application? So using the example of, uh, let's say your application is drawn first in the sequence. Uh, you're number one. And so when I, we say low, that means um, the, uh, you're drawn in the beginning of the cycle. Whereas mm -hmm. I may be 250,000, my sequence number, so I'm drawn last. I'm, so the higher the number, the worst luck you have, <laughs> maybe, maybe the, the way to put it, because again, it's completely random and... Uh, the computer just spits it out one through the very end. So it's, it's really is, it's luck of the draw. And completely random. Completely There's random. no way to get a better number or a, it's just totally luck of the draw. <laughs> no, it's exactly right. Don't, don't uh, uh, use any type of strategy being first or last because the computer doesn't care. <laughs> Okay, next question. If you draw a fourth choice tag and don't like the hunt, can you turn it in and get a refund? Uh, short answer is no. Uh, just because you don't like that. There, we do have some options, Tristana, on turning a, a license back in, um, but in general, those are non-refundable. So uh, if, if a person can or, or does turn the, the license back in, those will go to... Uh, groups that have been identified through the game commission um, and, and then handed out that way. And typically those go to, to youth or uh, military veterans or somebody with a disability that uh, is associated with a, with a, usually a nonprofit that um, has been approved to get those tags. Exactly. Or a first responder as well. Exactly right. And like I said, the, like you said, they, they must be approved uh, by the game commission prior to that hunting season in order to be eligible for those, correct. Okay. All right. I have another long question, so here we go. Um, do the draw odds change year yearly per hunt code based on work in the field and or does the department change, oh, sorry. Does it change based on your work in the field and or department changes? So if we look at unit 29 hunt code for deer, for example, will the number of tags be different this year than last year? Short answer again, um, uh, if it's in the same rule cycle, uh, chances are no, unless there's an extreme event where the department came in, identified that and said, we need to reduce licenses based on a specific instance. But, so, but to answer that question specifically, uh, no, um, uh, the four-year rule cycle uh, those licenses should remain very, very stable over those four years. Now, again, and, and yet again, Tristana, you pointed out earlier that uh, this upcoming season, 2022 and 23 season is the last year of the four-year rule cycle. And so we're going through that process now to uh, gather um, uh, public comment and, and information for the next four years, which will start 2023 and 24. Yep. 
in the only way that those those tag numbers inside that four year rule cycle would change would be um, say there's a, a a disease or um, like a EHD hits an elk herd or, or something like that, that that has a significant impact on the amount of animals in that unit, then the director has the ability to go in and make make changes that that's pretty rare. It is absolutely it's pretty rare. Uh, like I said, there are definitely some instances it does happen, but uh, it's 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 pretty rare. So as an example, we have, you know, um, you know, 25,000 elk in the southwest areas in example 20 25 30,000 you know we set the licenses based on on modeling and looking at you know cow to calf ratios bull to cow ratios um etc and so looking at those over the next four years we're going to set those licenses um and and unless like you just said unless there's an extreme event there there's not going to change Okay, my last question for you, unless something just burning comes up, I, I do want to start wrapping up because we've, we've been going for a little over an hour now. But, you know, when somebody calls you and, um, oh, thank you, Matt, that was a great comment. He said, thank you for the clarification and Kevin for your work in the field and pending retirement. Much appreciated. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when somebody calls you and says, you know, I'm applying for the first time in New Mexico, whether it's a resident or non-resident, what's the number one tip that you give them to help them prepare for a hunt or prepare for the draw? Uh, it goes back to, I guess, what, what we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, what's your goals? You know, what do you want out of that hunt? Is it to learn a new area? Is it to to uh, hike a specific mountain. I guess what are, whatever the goals are, hunt older age class animals, that's gonna be the very, very first step in my mind. Once you identify what that is, you know, and again, that could be even, you know, what weapon type do you wanna use? You know, what age uh, class animal do you wanna hunt? Where do you wanna hunt? Maybe that's in the desert, you know, or maybe in the boot heel. You know, and then start lining up those goals and say, okay, now I get a better picture in my brain, you know, what I want to hunt, how I want to hunt, where do I want to hunt, and then I start looking at the, the big game rule and information booklet, along with these draw odds, and I think, and again, using your, your point, which was great, use the, the harvest reports and say, okay, wow, I'm starting to get a better picture here, you know, uh, but again, that very first thing is going to be, well, what is it that you want to get out of this hunt? Basically, that's the basic question. It, it, to, to, I think when I came to you last year and said, I need help with this hunt, you asked me that. That was literally the first question that you asked me. Was, what, what do you want? What are your expectations? So I, yep. I love that you said that because that's exactly the word for word what you told me last year. Well, then I passed the test. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot all about that until you just started talking and I went, oh my gosh, that's exactly what he said to me. Um, <laughs> so one more question from Facebook. Um, does marketing a fourth choice on an application affect my overall draw odds for that animal? No, it will not. Uh, again, we'll, we'll be looking at the first three choices first and only uh, if that specific application is not successful where all three hunt choices are filled, then, then that application is set aside for down the road until every other application is looked through, looked at in the sequence. Mm -hmm. And only if there's licenses available at that point, will the computer come back in and then look at someone's fourth choice. So the fourth choice has no bearing. So as an example, Tristan, let's say you and I put in for the exact same uh, hunts, hunt codes, you put in for the fourth choice and I don't, it has no bearing. You don't have a better drawing odds or worse, uh, vice versa. I don't have better or worse drawing odds. Thank you. Okay, so to wrap up, I'm gonna steal the screen from you really quick. I'm gonna put up some dates again. Okay. Um, but next up in the series, um, specific to this series, we're gonna be talking about pronghorn on, Wendy, on Wednesday. Wow, talking about pronghorn on Wednesday um, so make sure you're tuning in for that one. And I, I also want to put a plug in that, um, you know, Kevin, you mentioned several times 
that we're in the process, we're just beginning the process really of that four year rule cycle setting. And tomorrow night we have our first public meeting. Um, we're gonna be talking about pronghorn, uh, bighorn sheep and javelina, the rules that are specific to those three species. And I would encourage you if you haven't signed up for those, they will only be held on Zoom. We will not be having a Facebook Live component to those. But I would strongly encourage everyone to log in and see the recommendations that have come from Kevin and our other biologists and, and to provide public comment. It's, it's a great opportunity to get involved. Um, the information for that is on our website. If you go to the homepage and scroll all the way down to the bottom, it's on the events calendar and you can register for those Zooms. But I would strongly encourage you to get involved in that process if, you, if you're interested. Um, so we have that meeting uh, Tuesday and Thursday this week. On Wednesday, we'll be talking with Tony about pronghorn. Um, but again, the important dates coming up March 9th um, to apply for the to apply and qualify for the incentives. March 16th, which I believe is uh, 23 days, so just less than 23 days to get your applications in if you haven't done so already. And then if you haven't done your harvest report for species that you're still um, hunting, you can you have to have those done by April 7th. So make sure take a screen capture and and have those handy because you don't want to miss those dates. But um, I want to thank everybody on Facebook that attended and, and joined us tonight and everybody here in the Zoom. I really appreciated all of the conversation and the questions. So thank you very much for that. And Kevin, you know, thank you for spending your 23rd anniversary with the department here with us, <laughs> working late into the evening once again. Um, and really thank you for your time and your sharing your knowledge with this, this subject. I know we had a lot of questions about it and I know it's appreciated. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I mean, hopefully. Um, you know, that gratitude, I, I really do appreciate these, these, uh, webinars that we're doing. I think you're doing a phenomenal job. And, and again, if I could just say it to everybody out there, you know, get involved, you know, you know, attending things like this, uh, the rule cycle meetings that you're putting on game commission meetings, you know, get involved. Um, you know, hunting is, is, is for everybody out there and, you know, that wants to hunt and, getting that input and, and understanding how we do things. Cause I think as, as you very well know, there's a lot of things maybe we don't understand. So getting educated is the first step. And so doing something like this for the report, uh, I really do enjoy it. So thank you very much. And, and, and I hope everybody out there uh, has enjoyed it as well. Well, thank you very much. And, and I'll sign off and say good night to everyone. So have a good evening. <laughs> Take care, Tristan and everybody. Good night.